Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Discuss with Meg Duke. I am so excited to be here this week. It's a beautiful sunny day where I am currently right now, which is not when you will be listening to this, because as we all know, with YouTube and podcasts, they don't get dropped the exact same day. So hopefully it's beautiful and sunny where you are, or if that's not your vibe, then I hope it's whatever kind of dreary, beautiful, sunny, rainy, cloudy, whatever weather it is that you're looking for. Um, Anyway, but I was really excited for this week's topic because I've been thinking about it a lot and I've been saying it a lot in both professional conversations and personal ones. And I thought that's this week's topic for sure. Um, And I'll jump into it more, but I want to introduce that two things can in fact be true. So I wanted to start us off by talking about thinking about thinking, right? So we talk about a lot of common thinking issues that we have. Um figuring out the difference between actual worrying events, things that are coming up. And then like it, we talked about it a little bit with Dr. Hughes last week, um, worrying about worrying, right? Anticipatory anxiety. And so we got to figure out what it is that's triggering us to think about worry and what it is that's triggering us to worry about becoming worried, which is, you know, uh, the complexities of the human of humanity, right? Um, of the human experience. That's what I was going to say. So um, that's one thing that it's it's all of this is thinking about being intentional, right? I use the word intentionality ten times a day, if not more. It's all about figuring out what am I going to allow myself to spend emotional capacity on? What am I going to use the whole brain box on and think about? this negative thing that's automatically popped in my head. It's automatic, I can't control what is automatic. That's the definition of automatic, but I can control where I go with that. That's what cognitive behavior therapy also often talks about. Thoughts lead to actions and feelings, right? So um, when you're intentional, when you're paying attention to what it is that you're thinking about, am I worrying about something that might possibly be, like am I putting energy, worrying is really not ever good energy, but am I putting maybe some anxious, nervous energy towards something that's gonna be productive? like? If you're trying to prepare for a presentation or you're going to propose to your partner, like these are the things like this is good, anxious energy. Like what can I do to help this, to use this creativity and, and move me forward? Right. But just worry for the sake of worry is what we really get the problem when we're just anticipating needing to worry about something. And you might, somebody might be like, all right, Meg, whatever, but you'd be surprised if you're paying attention and really tracking your moods and your thoughts and what's triggering you to have those moods and, and feelings and, and actions, you might recognize like, oh, I'm just worried about being worried. And that's a real thing. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's definitely one thing that we talk about a lot. And then generally like a lot of common thinking issues, you know, oh, overgeneralization. You'll notice if you've ever done couples therapy or just generally had a conversation using the words always and never, right? So like you always do this, you never do that, right? We never, never can say never, or always, right? We always want to make sure that we're trying to be more realistic in our conversations, discounting the positive, jumping to conclusions, mind reading, right? How many times have you ever tried to be like, oh, I know what you're thinking when you're in a disagreement with somebody, maybe a partner or a friend or a coworker or something. And it's like, mm, but do you know what they're thinking? I mean, based on your experiences with them, you probably have some sort of understanding of how things have happened in conversations in the past, but we can never really know. That's why we need to be curious and ask questions instead of just flat out telling somebody that they're already wrong. They've already wronged you in some way um, based on what you think that they're going to say based on your past experiences. Obviously that should, don't should on yourself. That's a Rachelism. That was my second field placement um, in grad school. Her name was Rachel and she remains to this day one of the most, most amazing therapists I've ever known. I have a little book of Rachelisms and I know she's not the only person who said this, but it's the first time I heard it was don't shit on yourself. And I thought it was funny because uh, I'm immature, but also too, it's so important. I shouldn't think this, I shouldn't feel this way. I should have done that. Da, da, da. And, you know, we talk about the difference between guilt and shame where guilt might be positive and can spur you along to make better choices in the future. But talking about the difference between that and shame of like, oh, I should do better. I should be more. I should know. Da, 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 da. So don't shut on yourself. Blame, personalization, all the common thinking issues, right? The one that I want to talk about today, though, is all or nothing thinking. Sometimes we call it black and white thinking, where it's like, if something isn't completely perfect, then it's all negative and you suck and you're terrible and that's it. 
Or one of the biggest things, like I said, I've been having this conversation, a lot of people wanting my opinion on things, which is great. I let like, yeah, great. Be curious. Ask me questions. Um, and I just keep saying like, well, much as nothing is ever all one thing or the other, I think this, and also I see where this is coming from. I think that, but I can also understand da, da, da. So I think, especially with our, oh, I think it was my hairstylist, Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Yes, it was her keyboard warriors. Again, I don't know if she coined the phrase or I'm just the first person. She's the first person that I heard it from. But when she said that, I was like, keyboard warriors. Yes. 2022, 2020. I mean, like with the advent of technology, we just feel the need to constantly be keyboard warriors and comment and have opinions and have thoughts on literally everything in the world. It's like some people cannot scroll past something without getting fired up about literally everything. And I just said, right, not all or nothing thinking. And I just said always, and I said literally everything, but it's so true though. Don't you, don't you know that person or perhaps you're recognizing like, mm, she's talking about me because everything gets us riled up about something. Everything is, we have to have an opinion and we have to have a thought and we have to, da, da, da. and so for me, it's like, how can I get to a space where I do have an opinion? Of course, I'm going to have an automatic thought. I'm going to have a reaction to something, but I want to sit with that for a moment and think, where's that person coming from? I've, I've had situations where I 100% have thought like, do I owe somebody an apology with this disagreement? I do not owe this person an apology for this disagreement. I'm reflecting on it. Like I'm, I'm disappointed that it happened, but I'm not going to apologize when I held myself in my high standards and those boundaries were not respected. But also I want to try to put myself in someone else's shoes and be able to say, where were they coming from? Where, how did we get to this place? And how can I help us get, again, solution focused? How can I get to the next space? Where are we going from here? What is the goal? Do we want to sit and rehash what you said and what I said and how we could have da, da, da? Maybe, maybe because maybe that really is our communication issue. And if that's what you need to do is focus on the problem and not the solution, that could be, but for me, I want to look at it the other way of like, so moving forward, what do you need from me? How can we communicate moving forward? Again, solution focus, right? Let's go forward. What can we go from there? So to be all or nothing, like I'm a hundred percent right. And you're a hundred percent wrong. Like I still can maintain that. I feel like I, that's the best that I could have done in the situation. And I still need more from the other person, the coworker, the loved one, the partner, whoever it might be. Um, but it doesn't need to be, it can be yes. And it can be also, I understand where, even though I disagree with you, I do at least want to put myself in your shoes and see where you are coming from. Instead of me just being like, well, you owe me an apology and I'm not speaking to you until you give me one. And like, where are we going to go from? Like, that's why I'm going to be a little tangential, but it's my podcast. I'm gonna do what I want. No. Um, but like, that's why people have so much trouble with couples therapy. Right. And I, you have these people who come in and oftentimes it's like one person is more invested than the other person. Sometimes the other person like genuinely does not want to be there and makes it very clear. Like I'm only here because some sort of threat, right? Custody battle, the house, monetary. So I'm only here, whatever it is. They're going to divorce me if we don't get the couple, whatever it is. I've had couples literally come in and be like, I do not want to be here. I don't care what you have to say, but I'm physically here. So then, right. And you can appreciate that because when you kind of think about a lot of conversations that you've had in the past with a partner or a, a coworker or a loved one, my, I have to apologize that my brain kind of does go to partner conversations because that's, I've never really had a couple in therapy who were coworkers, um, but I do know that Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff from My Favorite Murder, those of you who are murderinos, they have, I don't know if they still go or not, but they were having some issues with each other and they were both in individual therapy. They're both very open about talking um, and being wide open about mental health needs. And they went and got a therapist together. Now, I've never done that as a therapist. I've never had, you know, business partners come in, but it does happen. So I just want to keep everyone's mind open to that as well. But like, it's not just couples who do, you know, couples, a couple of humans, not a romantic couple. Um, so yeah. And when you're just going to show up and the therapist is going to side with one side, one person, which my job as a therapist is to try to remain non-judgmental and neutral as much as possible. But we know that doesn't always happen because we're all humans. Um, and if you're just sitting there letting somebody scream at you for an, like for 45 minutes, 
because they made you come here and like, what are you getting done? It's all problem focused. It's not interesting. I'm not motivated. I'm not going to get anything out of it. I'm not going to participate. So um, thank you for letting me go on that tangent. But I really feel like that that's something else that we think about is like, when you're focusing on a solution, you're figuring out what it is that people need to be successful in some sort of partnership together. And I need this and I need that. Not you did this. You did that. You always do this. You never do that. Um, but I just, I would feel the best supported by doing this. And I would feel listened to when this happens and, and going from there. So I think that's, what's really important is that we're focusing on that kind of a conversation, getting away from black and white thinking this, that yes, no, all nothing. It's not, you know, I actually, I'm going to pull up, um, a Jung, a Carl Jung quote about paradox. He said, only the paradox comes anywhere near to comprehending the fullness of life, not ambiguity, uh, non-ambiguity and non-contradiction are one-sided and thus unsuited to express the incomprehensible. I mean, again, I'm talking about like the joys of humanity, right? So we're talking about figuring out how to describe life, <laughs> right? And much as with the complexities that go with that, many conversations, a lot of interpersonal things, even things that have nothing to do with anything else. I know I've kind of got off on like a couples thing or you and your um, mom or you and a, a good friend from high school or you and a coworker, right? It can just be you and you yourself as a human individually. So I, I want to bring that back because I did go off on that and I don't take back that, but I also say like, you as an individual, this can be just you too. Like you can be sitting with tension and not understand. And that that the trouble that we have is tolerating that discomfort. We have to fix things. We have to have an answer. We need closure, that word, my goodness, right? We, we have trouble sitting with the tension of opposites um, that in fact, multiple things can be true. That in fact, we don't have to know the answer to everything all the time, always. And that's really tough for us because we're kind of taught that we're supposed to, you're supposed to figure it out. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with yourself? What is real? Know this, know that. And instead of doing that, I think it's helpful if we can look at like the fullness of humanity and what it means to be truly human and not try to have perfectionism, which is just, you know, covering up our shame and whatever our issues are that we, if I'm a perfectionist, no one can blame me for doing something wrong, which we know is unhealthy. Um, and so we're looking at being okay with not being okay. And how do we get there, right? So tolerating discomfort, we talk about distress tolerance and emotion regulation, two big keys in dialectic behavior therapy, but just in general, I talk about that out. I, I am not licensed in DBT. It's not something I'm, um, I'm focused on, but I do talk about emotion regulation and distress tolerance with every single per every single client. And sometimes with friends <laughs> we're talking about like figuring out, um, you know, my two-year-old, how can I help him to be able to be okay with not being okay sometimes and working on building patience and skill and, you don't get exactly what you want 100% of the time and that's okay. But how do we sit in that discomfort and hold that tension in a healthy and safe way where it's not driving us crazy because we're recognizing paradox exists, which I'm not trying to teach my two and a half year old about paradox. Everyone's like, okay, Meg, sure you are. No, I'm not. But I'm just saying for the adults who are listening, moving on from that, um, that's, that's the goal of this conversation is to get away from the all or nothing thinking and being okay with sitting in that. Um, I actually had a an LCSW supervisee who, by the way, another tangent, he passed his exam on the first try just last week, had another supervisee pass on the first time. And I got to tell you what, I'm so proud of both of them. I could just, oh, I could cry. The hard work that goes into supervision to get your clinical licensure is amazing. And I'm so proud. So kudos to both of them. Um, but the, the first one who had passed his um, exam last year, actually, we talk about like black and white and gray space, right? Well, he said like, let's function in, in the rainbow. He's like, well, why do we have to be black and white? Let's function in the rainbow. And I love that. I love that so much because even gray, they're only, well, I guess there are 50 shades of gray. Haven't read the book, haven't seen the movie, all set. But uh, maybe that's your, maybe that's your thing. And that's great. There are obviously multiple shades of gray, but I just think it's so much more fun because you can have all of the shades of the colors of the rainbow, right? Like all the colors, let's focus on getting outside of this or that yes or no all or nothing, black or white. We're functioning within the rainbow. We're figuring out what we can do there and figuring out how by learning to sit with that tension and being okay with the, with the discomfort, 
distress tolerance helps us to be able to regulate our emotions, our moods, which then can help us to not run to Target after you've had a particularly stressful morning and buy a bag of chocolate covered donuts and eat them for breakfast. I did not do that this morning. What are you talking about? Um, so not my best emotion regulation moment, but binge eating disorder, sometimes that's what happens. So, but I'm aware of it and I'm going to process that. And I'm going to work through that with my own therapist and then we'll figure out how to deal with anxiety and stress in a better way next time. And also I'm not going to judge myself because uh, that's not helpful either. I'm going to recognize the choice. And I think, hmm, what could I have done this morning? Maybe gotten on the bike and done an exercise. Cause that to me is very fun. I, I enjoy that very much. I surprising to probably nobody was a spinning instructor in undergrad. So I really enjoy that. Um, taking a walk reading a book might have done many things right besides that but it's what I chose to do so I'm not going to judge myself but I am going to show you all that I'm human and talk about sometimes I don't tolerate my own distress very well um so how do we get to a space where being okay where we're being okay with not being okay how do we do that and it's so deeply personal for each person and it's recognizing that it's again i talk to a lot of clients about uh mood tracking right and i know it sounds kind of hokey and cheesy of like oh i'm gonna take my journal out i'm gonna write down how i felt between nine and noon i felt whatever but it's so helpful because we just roll through the days we're not intentional we don't recognize like i'm making a point of recognizing what has set me off today what has triggered me why did i feel like i needed why specifically meg why did i feel the need to go by me some chocolate donuts. Sorry, Austin. He's probably like, you did what? He's in New Mexico. Anyway. Um, but yeah, like what set me off? Am I able to recognize the things that might set me off so that I can set myself up for better success so that if I need to decompress in some way that I can set myself up and know like I'm going to do this thing instead? Or can I just kind of sometimes be okay with not being okay? And not so much seeking feedback and validation from other people even, but sometimes it can be helpful to talk to somebody or to have that support or also how can I talk to myself? How can I be okay within my own space, right? How do we help ourselves open our minds too? Because I think, unfortunately, a lot of this all or nothing thinking kind of comes along to politics and the state of the world. And I feel like a lot of people are, are talking about the stressors that they're having interpersonally, talking about politics. I'm going to just use that word very globally because I don't want to go into specifics, but think about the things related to pandemic and politics and um yeah it's it's tough because we have very certain things that we're our minds are set on and I can think of times where I've been like oh I haven't heard that tell me more I can't believe that in my mind I'm thinking I can't believe that to be true which is a judgment but I'm in the conversation trying to be non-judgmental and I want to say hadn't heard that tell me more educate me maybe that did happen and maybe i need to know and if i don't know and that actually did happen or somebody said something that i can't believe somebody would say but show me the receipts teach me educate me um so i'm trying to keep an open mind and it's hard sometimes because sometimes people are ignorant <laughs> but also sometimes people know things that you don't know and that's okay it's okay not to know my son has a book that my my sister-in-law, um, Lolly, hi, Lolly, got him, and he is obsessed with it. And one of the pages says, it's okay not to know, you know? And I even put that in my syllabus for my course this week or this semester. Like, that's my goal is for us to get to a space where we say, it's okay not to know, you know? And I feel like it's not okay not to know globally, societally. Don't you feel that? I feel that, I feel that like, I walk into a room and people want me to know and they want me to have an opinion and I need to be right and I need to be able to fact check it. I need to be able to back it up. And I do think that there are certain things if you're going to start spewing stuff, he said, she said, this happened, that happened, CDC regulations require whatever. Like if you're not accurate, maybe let's not spread misinformation. Let's not, not maybe not, let's not spread misinformation. But in terms of like, it's also okay then to say, I don't know. It's not okay to spread misinformation. It's not okay to be disrespectful or hateful or push boundaries or completely stomp all over boundaries. But it is okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I need to think on that. I never had an opinion and now I feel like I want to have one. I had an opinion. You're bringing me new information. That's the frustrating thing too. Well, so-and-so said something and they were wrong. And so they need to die. <laughs> it's like, they need to go away. Like, 
So we're not allowed to learn new things. Like we can learn new things. We can. It's okay not to know. It's okay to be curious. It's okay to ask if you have a PhD. It's okay to do some research. It's okay to listen to people with PhDs or MDs or whatever things that they do that they are doing their research and find what they think and what they have learned and their new way of doing things based on new information. It's okay for us to be able to say like, I don't know. Let me see if I can find someone who knows more about that and get a proper set of information before I just start spouting off. And so how do we open our minds and get to a space where we can say, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to, I'm going to hold my, hold my thoughts. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm not going to hear to respond. That is a frustration to me. One of my biggest pet peeves. Animals dressed as humans, maybe friends reference joke. Uh, no, that doesn't bother me. Although my dog goes what we call dogatonic when we try to put clothes on him. But um, yeah, animals dressed as humans, sure. But one of my biggest things is you can just tell when someone's talking and they're not listening to hear you. They're listening because they're ready to smack you down with a response. Like, or not even smack you down with a response sometimes. Sometimes they're just so excited about something, but you can, and, that, and that's great. I love that you're ener energized and enthusiastic about the topic of conversation that I have brought up. So I love that. And also, I'm also trying to talk, I'm trying to talk to you. I want to hear what you have to say. Can you, can you ingest what I've said before you just immediately? And it's like, no, because they're already six stories ahead of us where they want to take this conversation, sometimes for positive with excitement and sometimes ready to beat you down you are wrong and here's why and so I think that's other thing too is like how can we listen to each other listen to understand listen with curiosity and question not listen with judgment listen to answer listen to be right I said this once in a conversation recently where you know that person who it's more important for them to be right than it is for them to be kind I, I definitely do and and I hate that for people because people are generally kind. And I know people who I'm thinking about, I'm like, oh, can be very kind people. It's whether or not you choose that you want to be right or do you want to be kind. And that's a value judgment for yourself. I think sometimes, even though you might feel something is important, and if it is that important that somebody understands that you are correct more so than appreciating their boundaries, then that's a judgment call that you'll have to make. And it's a very individual one for each individual situation, but it's figuring out this conversation isn't going well, and maybe we can move on. And I'm going to be kind and respectful and recognize that. And it's not important to me to be right. I, again, I've said this before, my goal is to be able to ask questions um, I think I've mentioned it before in the podcast. I've definitely mentioned it before in social settings. And uh, I read Whitney Cummings group book, I'm fine and otherwise, which is, she's insanely witty. And I think that's so funny. And it's like the picture of her is like, she's smiling and she has this beautiful top knot and everything looks great. Her makeup is done. And then underneath of her up to her neck is water. So like barely treading water is the metaphor there. I think, um, I'm fine and other lies. And I think that was great. And she talks about like, it's okay to not know everything. It's okay. I come back to that. It is okay to say, I don't know. It's okay not to know, you know, it's okay. And asking questions. So um, I'd like for us to think this week about like, what is it that I can do to sit with tension? What is it? What can I do to recognize that the world is not, humanity does, is not comprised of this or that, generally speaking? It's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Let's function in the rainbow. How can I sit in that rainbow understanding that maybe some of that brings me some discomfort because some things can be true that I thought weren't true or vice versa. Some things maybe are still true, but aren't a hundred percent. Like I, like I firmly grasped in my tiny little hands that this was true. And maybe it's not all that. Maybe there are other ways of looking at things. And then opening our minds. So I want to leave you all. I've been thinking, obviously, you all know Brene Brown's one of my heroes. Um, she's got a PhD in social work. She does research. I would love to get a PhD in social work and do some research. On, I have, keep thinking about what my thesis would be, like substance use and perinatal disorders, um, adult onset ADHD diagnosis. I would love to talk about it. Anyway, I'm not going to say it, John. I, but I literally have like a list of different thesis topics, wildly not related to each other wildly not real like just I'm all over the place so um but anyway so Brene Brown and I love how at the end of her podcast every single time she says say awkward 
brave and kind. Um, wait, now look, look at me. I'm, is it awkward, brave and kind? I said, I almost said curious. That's why I'm going awkward, brave and kind. No, it's embarrassing, but whatever. Here I am. Um, and I've been thinking like, I'd like, how can I wrap this up succinctly? Y'all know I ramble. Y'all know I'm all over the place. I make, I make apologies. Thank you for still being listening this far into the episode. Um, I'm working on it, getting better. Practice makes progress. But I, I would like a button. I'd like something that's not cheesy, that's not like, and I certainly don't want to steal from somebody, but I am going to borrow because I that is not my expression. Um, but it really, I felt like this was the appropriate I'd come up with it a couple of weeks ago. And this is the, this is the topic of conversation by myself that I thought was the best time. So y'all also probably have heard how obsessed I am with Ted Lasso. I love Jason Sudeikis. He's actually from Kansas city. Funny enough. If you've seen Ted Lasso, you know that, <laughs> um, or anything else he's been in that you may have seen an article about him, whatever. So, um, I'm obsessed with Ted Lasso. I studied abroad in London. I'm obsessed with England. I'm obsessed with soccer, football. Um, big Chelsea fan because I lived in Kensington when I lived over there. So it's like all of my favorite things. It's comedy. It's my type of comedy. It's so warm and nurturing. I don't know. I'm doing like an ad for Ted Lasso right now. I'm really sorry. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's on Apple TV. So I understand that you have to pay for um, access to that as well, but it is wonderful if that somehow you can get your hands on that. Um, and there's this beautiful episode and this beautiful scene. And he, he has a very long story, but one of them is talking about Walt Whitman's quote, be curious, not judgmental. And so that's what I would like us to take with us every single week, no matter what the topic is, no matter if it's parenting or lactation or motherhood and identity or sleep studies, or today, obviously all or nothing thinking and two things can be true. I want us to, as Ted says, Walt said, be curious, not judgmental. And I'd like for us to leave on that. I mean, that's what I'm going to leave us with every week. So I hope you all have a great week. I hope you all uh, have a great couple of um, guests coming up that I've got scheduled that I'm so excited about. Um, we're, we're going international. Got, got a beautiful Canadian spirit coming on this week. Um, so we're, we're going officially international though. On, actually though, there are people in Ottawa and Toronto listening um, so hello to you. I know my girl Maria listens over in Northern Ireland, so I'm already international, but in terms of guests. Um, so those of you who are listening internationally. Oh, and Melissa out in Germany as well. Um, so not to say that you all haven't already been here. You've been here since day one. I love you all. And I deeply appreciate you for being here. But in terms of guests, we're bringing that international flair. So um, really excited to have that on. Um, and I hope you all have a great, great week. And I'm looking forward to the future.